Hello everyone and welcome to History of the Second World War. On this episode of our Spanish Civil War interview series, I chatted with Dr. Danny Evans. Some of our previous interviews in this series revolved around anarchism, and this time I discussed the anarchist movement during the Civil War. We discussed the preparedness of the anarchist groups for the war, their reactions to the start of the conflict, and then many of the political developments that occurred within the Republican camp as the Civil War developed. One topic that we discussed that I think is worth reiterating here before the interview begins is that it can be easy to categorize people into certain political ideologies based on their self-categorization or due to the groups that they say that they belong to. However, when looking at historical individuals or movements or, or groups, it's far more important to look not at their statements or titles, but instead at their actions. This is true for communists, like we discussed in this interview, but also can be applied to many other groups at almost any time. And welcome to the Spanish Civil War interview series. Today, I'm here with Dr. Danny Evans from Liverpool Hope University and the author of Revolution in the State, Anarchism in the Spanish Civil War. Dr. Evans, how are you doing today? I'm all right, thank you. Thanks very much for having me. Yeah, thank you for joining us. So we'll just jump right into the questions here. Um, so when the Spanish Civil War started, how was the conflict viewed by anarchists? And more specifically, how did they view cooperation with the leadership of the Republic? My understanding is that there were some divisions within the Spanish anarchist movement about if the Republican government should be supported at all. Yeah, well, um, that's a good question, Wesley. I, I gather that you're going to be speaking to um, my, uh, a friend of mine, Matt Curry, at some point, and he knows a lot more about um, what I'm going to say than, than that in, initially than I do. But there was a very strong sentiment that had developed in the 1930s among anarchists and the wider left in Spain, and um, particularly in light of what was happening in Europe with the rise of, um, of Nazism and authoritarian um, right-wing regimes, that the left in Spain wasn't going to go down without a fight. And so members of anarchist or anarchist-influenced organizations, such as the Anarcho-Syndicalist Union, the CNT, made what preparations they could to face down the, um, the military coup. And then uh, in the beginning of the Civil War, they enlisted in the tens of thousands for the militias that set out to try and recover the areas that had been lost to the military rising. So the anarchists viewed the military rising as a matter of life and death right from the get-go. And I think it's important to stress that because um, you occasionally see some quite flippant remarks about the anarchist supposed attitude towards the Civil War. But there was never any, um, any bones made about how um, existential this uh, threat was to to the anarchist movement, and, and um, they viewed it in those terms right from the beginning. On to the question of collaboration then. The, given that the Republican authority dissolved in the face of the attempted coup, anarchists in the areas of Spain that had successfully resisted the rising formed a part of um, a series of ad hoc anti-fascist organisations alongside other forces on the, on the left, um, defined broadly, you know, including some uh, moderate Republicans. And the makeup of these um, anti-fascist anti committees tended to be um, based on the balance of forces that had existed in, any, in those areas prior to the rising, and balance of forces within the left and the, and the labor movement. Now, because the central Republican government had effectively disappeared from the picture at this point, the question of formal collaboration with the state, as opposed to simple participation in ad hoc committees, was first posed on the regional rather than the national level for the anarchist movement. And it was posed most dramatically and most importantly in Barcelona, um, where the anarchist movement was very strong and where the defense committees of the CNT had played the most significant role in the suppression of the, of the military rising. And where also the defeat of the coup had very rapidly developed into a revolutionary situation. So during those tumultuous days right, of a, of a revolutionary situation in which the military rising has only just been suppressed and in which the, the CNT's um, the level of the CNT's mobilization had been absolutely um, instrumental in putting the military rising down. A group of anarchists, leading anarchists, meet in Barcelona and discuss whether they should collaborate in a body that was called the um, Central Committee of Anti-Fascist Militias. 
which um, which they decided that they would do. And um, this body, although it, it appeared on the face of it to be just one more ad hoc um, committee, ad hoc anti-fascist committee, was in fact formally subordinate right from the beginning to uh, the Generalitat, which is the regional government of, of Catalonia. Um, anarchist collaboration in the central government doesn't come about until several months later, November 1936, under the premiership of the socialist Lago Caballero, when the central government, governmental authority of the Spanish Republic has um, been recovered, more or less. In the meantime, um, alternative proposals that the anarchist movement, and specifically the CNT, had put forward for a government by anti-fascist committee, which would, would have been dominated by the labor U unions, have been um, dismissed. So at every stage of this process, um, some people within the anarchist movement, including in the, the quite restricted um, meeting that first decided on collaboration in Barcelona, had raised opposition to this question of formal collaboration with the state, right? anarchism being um, a movement which by definition is against uh, the, the state. But it's only really with the entrance of anarchists into government, into central government, and the enormous um, shock of seeing anarchist government ministers that a, a, a sort of concrete oppositional movement within Spanish anarchism uh, began to crystallize. Uh, interesting. So, so did this, did the relationship between those two groups uh, evolve over time? Like uh, the anarchists who were involved in the central government and those who uh, were perhaps ideologically opposed to such actions. Did that evolve over the course of, of the Civil War early on or, or even later on when, as the Civil War kind of evolved and started going poorly? Yeah, yeah. so the, well, the relationship evolves in different directions. Um, it's, it's important to, to note that although the, um, the, the anarchist movement had traditionally been defined by um, its uh, sorts of directly democratic internal functioning. So what it was, it had like the organization such as the CNC had mechanisms to um, limit the sorts of emergence of hierarchy within those organizations. They were meant to like operate from a bottom up um, direction and um, you know, la largely had done, you know, with them, um, with some caveats in, in the years prior to the, the civil war. But this democratic functioning was greatly disrupted by the war. So the debate about the role that the organization would play in Republican administration was largely played out among reduced circles of leading activists in the uh, Republican rearguard, who were, who were called uh, higher committees, you know, to, to, as a sort of literal translation from how, what they're known as in Spanish. Um, and in some ways, the Spanish Civil War and the, and the revolution presents the paradox of um, anarchist traditions of direct democracy becoming the basic organizing principle of certain workplaces and um, certain industries and whole societies in, in the case of some um, towns and villages, um, particularly in rural areas. Well, while the formal organizations of anarchi anarchism themselves became more hierarchical. So it's a paradox. Um, from the winter of 1936, so as I mentioned, like following the CNC's formal entrance into central government, into 1937, you have a crystallization of um, an oppositional movement within um, Spanish anarchism. Discontent spreads among the middle ranks and the grassroots of the anarchist movement with regard to the direction that the, um, the leadership was taking. And this began to find organizational expression. You have like new newspapers appearing, new affinity groups being formed, um, particular centers of opposition, such as branches of the libertarian youth organizations, also the anarchist women's organization, Mujeres Libres, Free Women. And these um, sort of oppositional centers coalesced around campaigns to extend and coordinate the revolution also defend it from encroachments from the state and from um, police operations, which were becoming an increasing issue as 1937 went on. Um, this all like, sort of reaches ahead 
with the the May Days of 1937. From a, sort of the the leadership perspective, so like they they had made a, a certain decision uh, about how to work with the other forces on the left in Spain. How, how did they view these uh, these other groups, the, these sort of splinter groups um, during this period? Like from an anarchist perspective, from what I understand, they don't have a lot of ideological ground to stand on in terms of, hey, you should follow our choices. Um, so, so how did they interact with those those other groups? Well, um, not well, not well in the main, <laughs> you know. Um, they largely see it as an issue of um, a source of a threat to their control. Um, there's... Uh, Lots of sorts of bureaucratic attempts to, sh- to shut down opposition and you know, declaring like, um, meetings unconstitutional and, th- and things like this, attempting to um, sort of discredit the um, uh, conclusions that those meetings come to. Or um, as the war goes on, particularly after the May days, you have like um, attempts to kick out oppositional groups such as the Friends of Duruti. You have the CNT like leadership collaborating in the closure of um, like oppositional centres around like de- de- around the defence committees, also even the closure of newspapers. You know, something unheard of. You know, that the that, um, the anarchist leadership is actively involving itself in censorship of its own of its own activists. You know, and and um, and, and there are worse. You know, there are, there are even there are some even worse examples. As from from their point of view. You know, they felt that having made this um, commitment to collaboration, um, any any sort of threat to that was was effectively threatening um, the the war effort. You know, the, the broader um, picture of the war effort, and, um, and so that gave like their argument a kind of moral force and urgency that overrode any ideological scruple that they that they may have felt. Um, the problem for them was in terms of like uh, having any kind of uh, uh, credibility with the wider anarchist movement was that they hadn't actually, you know, they hadn't succeeded in winning um, much support for their ideas. You know, they, they had been incorporated into the structure of government largely to then be um, sidelined effectively. And, um, you know, the, the, the use of the, uh, the anarchist leadership as far as, um, the state authorities was concerned was that, that they would act to discipline their own membership, which is effectively what happened. You know, but the most notable example being during the May days when um, there is this mass mobilization on the, the part of the anarchists, like the middle ranking anarchist activists and the grassroots against um, the, the police and the, the, the authorities and, and particularly the, the, you know, the Stalinist forces um, in, in Catalonia which is then demobilized by um, the anarchist leadership through, um, through bureaucratic maneuvering effectively. So yeah, I mean, in many respects, the anarchist movement is, if, if not formally, is, is, effectively, is, is effectively split um, from that point on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so you mentioned that the, so the anarchists had, had joined in with the government or were collaborating with the government, I should say. So, so what was their relationship like with the, the communists or other groups uh, within that government? Uh, it was quite strained from what I understand. Um, how, how did they sort of coexist in the face of what, what was a common enemy? Um, yeah. So, uh, Within within government, like there is there is rivalry between um, the communists and and um, the CNT. Um, I suppose where, where the rivalry is most uh, inflamed is actually on, is on the streets um, in in the in the Republican rearguard, and um, it's, this is commonly presented as an ideological problem, which I think is misleading. Really, um, communism with a capital C in Spain was Stalinism, which is to say that it wasn't really an ideology. You know, it's, it's the name given to the politics of counter-revolution in Russia and elsewhere. And in Spain in particular, it's the politics that provides a structure of opportunity for people who are enemies of the CNT, enemies of the revolution, and are uh, personally ambitious. So to, get, you know, to give a couple of examples related to um, Catalonia in particular, 
In the first months of the civil, civil war, the CNT's committees had taken charge of food distribution in the city of Barcelona. They famously turned the Ritz Hotel into a, a, a popular canteen. When the General Etat, the regional government of Catalonia, re-established control of this area, they, um, the man who was put in charge of food supplies was Juan Comorera, who on the face of it was the chief representative of Catalan communism. So he's the, he's the general secretary of the PSUC, which was the Catalan branch of the Third International, the Comintern. But Comorera's policy, right from the get-go, was to reintroduce a free market in food. And this rapidly led to hoarding, rapidly led to shortages, bread queues. But quite aside from the failures of this policy, it's, you know, it's clear that it's, it's not an ideological move to introduce a free market in food and puts Comorera to the right of Winston Churchill. You know, there's no, there's no ideologi ideological justification for this. Um, it's not only does it like, place him on, on the right uh, politically, it puts him at odds with the stated communist goal of, the, of that particular moment in Spain, right, of, of increasing centralization and interest for more coordinated war efforts. Um, so you can't, you can't make sense of um, communism in Spain at this time by taking it at face value, right? You, it, it only makes sense, I mean, Comorero's policy only makes sense in terms of shoring up support, a uh, support base among um, shopkeepers and, you know, the, and the better off who can afford to buy on the black market. And he's trying to curry resentment and division on the Barcelona streets. And that is not something that you can justify according to communist ideology or war aims, right? You can only understand it by, um, by trying to understand Stalinism as these slippery politics of counter-revolution and personal ambition. Um, let's take another example. Ricardo Burillo is, is a soldier, um, a veteran of the um, colonial wars in Morocco. He's made chief of police in Barcelona after the May days in 1937. So as chief of police, he's responsible for the arrest of thousands of, of revolutionaries, anarchists and, and Marxists. He, in, he's responsible for operations that dismantle um, like centers, working class centers, educational centers, the sack libraries and so forth in Barcelona. And he's personally involved in the scandalous attempt to establish um, a completely false connection between um, the Spanish fascists and the anti-Stalinist Marxist Andreu Nin, whose Soviet agents had, had tortured to death in, um, in the summer of 1937. She's personally involved in that. So seemingly a very committed Stalinist. But he's later expelled from, from the party. And he then takes part at the end of the war in what's known as the Casado coup, right? The, the, the infighting that brings the Republican war effort to an end. It's anti, you know, an anti-communist uh, power grab. So if, you know, it's basically impossible to understand that kind of career trajectory if you understand communism as, as having an independent meaning as a belief system or a set of loyalties. You, you can only really understand them as being about personal ambition tied to an absolute overweening um, commitment to the counter-revolution. Um, and I'm sorry if that's like laboring the point in terms of, in terms of the question, um, but it's, it's only to, to illustrate the fact that as, as long as anarchism was a revolutionary movement, right? And, and this is um, uh, debatable in, in Spain. You know, it's, it's a revolutionary movement. On the one hand, it's also, um, you, you know, a party of government. But as, insofar as anarchism remained a revolutionary movement, it could not coexist with communism or with so-called communism in Spain. And not for any ideological reason, not for any like, reasons of sectarianism or anything like that. It's because the only uniting characteristic and the overriding priority of Spanish communism was opposition to the revolution. Um, and, you know, Stalinism, it's important to acknowledge, was only one aspect of the process by which the revolution was sidelined and then extinguished. And there has been a tradition in, in a lot of historical writing about the Spanish Civil War, perhaps to overemphasize the role of, of um, the communists, uh, you know, to sort of present like count, the counter-revolution and the, the process whereby, whereby Republican state authority was reconstructed as being a kind of Machiavellian Soviet-inspired plot. And, you know, I don't go along with that, right? But the problem... Um, you know, with what gets lost in this debate 
or what gets what gets certainly overstated in this debate, regardless of which side you you happen to fall on, is the supposed ideological coherence of um, of, of Spanish communism, which can lead to really ridiculous readings of of the internal conflicts that took place in the republic. So, if, for example, um, Eric Hobsbawm, who you know is, is obviously um, a famous and in many ways great historian, the latest historian wrote an article in, in the Guardian newspaper, like going back quite a bit now, in which he said that the internal conflicts of the Republic between anarchists and um, communists were effectively an echo of the dispute between Marx and Bakunin, which is, you know, is, not in, is not helpful to understanding the conflicts at all. I mean, these people you know, that I'm referring to, not necessarily the grassroots of the Communist Party, but their, their leaders, these people were Marxists, like Donald Trump is a Christian. You know, li- <laughs> yeah. And he's literally, you know, comparable. Okay. Yeah, it, it's interesting to, uh, th- that seems like a, a kind of thing where uh, over time, the simplification maybe of the narrative of the Spanish Civil War has actually caused problems in terms of understanding what is actually happening there. Because even I just, you know, oh yeah, they're they're communists. And then I sort of associate a certain set of, uh, ideological beliefs to those people that may not in any way be applicable. Yeah, I mean, and uh, it, I mean, that's it's completely understandable, really, on the face of it. But it's, it's I suppose, it's like one of the tragedies of Stalinism is that it corrupts the meaning of of communism and and how it, that might be interpreted or understood. Um, I mean, there is a, there is a defensible, arg- you know, defendable argument about um, you know, the the right. Uh, approach to take in during the civil war um with regards to questions like centralization and things like that coordination but um the you know th- things like reintroducing a, a, a free market which which um you know was an uh, was an armed reintroduction right it was done a reintroduction of privatization which was done at, at the bayonet point and which involved like street fighting in order to back it up there's no way that that can be justified according to um, the supposed priorities of uh, winning the war, and certainly not by any sort of like traditional communist understanding. Even in like in like you know, sort of Leninist variants, um, you know, you can imagine like a, a suggesting something like that during the period of uh, war communism. Um, I mean, you know, the whole point about Stalinism is that it, it tries to find. You know, he does these like somersaults to try and find like some kind of textual ideological justification for everything that it does. Um, so that it, during the, the Spanish Civil War, it, it, it's, um, it sort of presented its policies as a kind, as a, a kind of Spanish NEP. So I don't know if like you, you and your listeners are familiar with like um, Russian history, but the, the NEP being Lenin's new economic policy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He brought in from 1921, which reintroduced some elements of a free market into Russian society. But this was done after the civil war had been won. You know, this like, there's no sort of analogy or like comparable basis for, for introducing what, you know, in effect was um, a totally counterproductive measure um, in, in Spain. And, you know, the, the, another sort of the tragic aspect of this, which is like commented on by um, anarchist uh, participants in this fascinating documentary, which is available online with English subtitles called uh, "Living U- Living Utopia," which talks about the anarchist revolution and anarchist experience in Spain during the Civil War. And one of the um, contributors, you know, who'd been a participant, says that you know it's, it's a it's a great paradox that is difficult for people to appreciate. But the, the, there were genuine communist experiments going on, right? Humbling, moving experiments in living. Um, in an in, in organizing society in an egalitarian way in Spain during the Civil War, and they were destroyed by military units commanded by somebody who called himself a communist. You know, <laughs> in that, I mean, that's you know, that's just one of the, the paradoxes of, of Stalinism, um, and yeah. So I don't know. I, I, I think I've laid this point long enough, but. <laughs> you know to me it's like it's it's really important mm-hmm. yeah i think the the distinction there is is very important um 
So, so switching away from, from the political side of things, obviously this was a civil war. There was fighting military units. Um, so on the military side of things, how were anarchist military units organized and led? I know there were, there were regional or, or local sort of defense committees, but did that extend into the military units who saw service like, you know, at the front line, maybe even away from their home areas? Yeah, it's, it's a good and complicated uh, question. And it's, um, it's possible that my response in some ways will be so, somewhat limited and that you know, there are some people who are more experts in this area than myself. So I'll do my best. Um, the, the militias were initially organized by these defense committees, which were um, answerable to the anarchist organizations, um, primarily the CNT. So the structures of the CNT, as you say, right, which are organized along like you know, into local, regional, national committees and so forth, they don't map onto the militia units exactly in the sense that the militia units replicate those um, uh, organizational uh, um, forms. But the militias are, at least to an extent, answerable to the regional organizations of the CNT. So, you know, there's some sort of democratic oversight, if you like. The anarchist militia columns had their own war committees and there were some elected delegate representation within those war committees, right, from the actual militias themselves. Um, but democratic control over the leadership of the columns was limited. Um, I mean, if you think that, like, you know, a lot of these columns are actually named after their commander, so it would have been a bit awkward, you know, <laughs> if, 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 like, they tried to vote the Ruti out and, you know, what are we going to call a column? You know, that would be the first, like, issue to, to face. Um, so there were, there were uh, cases where grievances with commanders uh, were brought before the CNT's regional committees by ordinary soldiers. So, you know, that, so that did happen. So they did have recourse. But what... Um, but I suppose you couldn't just like, if, if you felt like a, a commander was bullying or using their power arbitrarily, I don't know if there was like, I mean, you could feasibly call a, um, an assembly, but that wasn't necessarily built into the structures of how the militia operated. You had, you had, your immediate recourse was to the regional committee back in the rear guard. Um, but nevertheless, there was, a, you know, there was a libertarian democratic spirit at work within the militias, you know, um, which all well, George Orwell famously describes in relation to um, the Marxist militias that he was involved in. Um, you know, brought, something broadly comparable is taking place um, within the anarchist militias, and that it coexists uneasily with the brutal imperatives of war making and questions of discipline and things like that. Um, in terms of the democratic organizing, to so try and get back to your question, something that caused resentment among um, ordinary militia volunteers was the way in which they were effectively excluded from the decision-making processes back in the rear guard. Um, so if you think about it, a lot of the people who went off to fight were people who had already given the best part of their lives to union organizing. Um, they were like very committed. And they suddenly found that those unions that they'd spent so long building up you know, now had no um, way of incorporating their voice now that they were at the front. Um, so this was like a kind of anomaly. Um, it was rectified by the libertarian youth organizations, which like formed its, uh, which, um, which gave representation to uh, the front effectively, we allowed the, the front to send delegates to the congresses and things like that. But that, it was never, um, it was given very short shrift by the CNT at a regional and national level when it was raised. Uh, and it was raised, um, you know, in the, in the primary sources, you see it being raised by ordinary CNT members back in the rear guard. And it was raised by, by this really extraordinary um, assembly that was called among the anarchist militia units at the beginning of 1937. It had been called by um, the Iron Column and the Moroto Column, which was, um, I suppose, a, a less well-known anarchist column that was um, dug in in um, uh, Batha in the uh, north of uh, Granada province in, this, in south of Spain. And they called this uh, conference specifically to raise this problem of like, how their voice could be represented in, in the rearguard decision-making processes of the CNT. But the, um, the CNT's official representative who was there declared it you know, an unconstitutional meeting and their, you know, their concerns were basically um, brushed aside. Interesting. Um, but, sorry? I just said interesting. 
Yeah, well, well, it's interesting to me as well, you know, but uh, you never know, because like, you, you sort of like, you live this kind of dweeby existence being interested in all these aspects <laughs> of the anarchism as well, you have no idea really if it's interesting to, to other people. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, this, um, this democratic spirit in, within the militias was also demonstrated in the opposition to militarization, right, which is the subject of numerous assemblies and like conversations that were taking place over the course of months um in in the actual militia columns and units particularly with regard to things that were that were especially resented you know the formalization of rank pay differentials um saluting all the kinds of things that they, they felt that weren't only um contrary to the spirit of a revolutionary army but were actually um pointless you know um, <laughs> You know, weren't, weren't necessary to act, to act as an effective um, war effort. But all of those decisions that those assemblies came to, um, and the objections they raised were ultimately disregarded. You know, the, um, there was an enormous amount of pressure on um, to accept uh, militarization, um, and, and and you know, it was ultimately. Um, there's also you know, the the phenomenon of militia soldiers returning to the rear guard, which I think has been understudied. You know, there, are, there are a few quite famous cases of, um, of s- several hundred people like leaving the Deruti column, for example, in opposition to uh, militarization and going back to Barcelona. But I've you know, been finding like, more and more like um, I- seemingly isolated cases that amounts to a, a much bigger picture, I think, of, of um, anarchists leaving the front in the beginning of 1937 not leaving it in the sense of abandoning the fight against fascism, but thinking we need to go back to the rear guard. We need to sort out the, um, uh, the political direction of our movement. And then we can um, get back, back to fighting what we, what we want to fight, which is a revolutionary war. Uh, and that I think was an important factor in the process of radicalization of anarchist organizations in the, in the build up to the May day, May day's uprising. So, so do you think, um, sort of the the people at the front um and even you know that as you mentioned earlier sort of the 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 workers at at the bottom of of this sort of movement did, did they feel like an overall sense of perhaps even betrayal um at at what was happening uh, or what what decisions were being made um around them by you know people who a few years ago they may have agreed with on a lot of uh, sort of ideological things yeah, well, I mean, it's it's difficult. It's perhaps difficult to generalise. There is a definite sense of betrayal um, around the, the events of the May Days because um, one of the key figures who um, in in the demobilisation of the May Days, right, of the of the, um, of, um, the process whereby anarchist um, militants left the barricades um, when they'd been in a, in a very um, promising situation in terms of like taking over Barcelona effectively. One of the key figures in that demobilization was um, Juan García Oliver, who was at that point Minister of Justice in the Republican government, but who had been the key dashing figure of uh, revolutionary insurrectionism in the years prior to, um, in the years prior to the civil war. So it was a very bitter pill, I think, a very bitter pill for people to swallow, particularly people who had gone into the streets with him in uprisings in, you know, in 1933 and so forth, um, who looked to him as like a kind of incorruptible figure. You know, when he, he made these like radio broadcasts over um, Barcelona radio during the May days, appealing to um, all sides to lay aside their arms and completely disregarding any of the kind of um, political issues that were at work here and any of the reasons that you know, the anarchists might have had to, you know, to bitterly resent the, um, the Stalinist and, and Catalan nationalist uh, operations that had been taking place um, you know, that, that sparked off the, the, the May Day's uprising. He completely disregards all that. He says, you know, if, if I was to um, um, like kiss the, the, the bodies of those who have fallen in this unfortunate fratricidal battle, I wouldn't know, you know who to kiss first you know, for the police or, or my anarchist uh, brothers, you know, people listening to that, um, you know, there are eyewitness reports of people crying with frustration, people refusing to believe that, um, that Gathe Oliver was, was, was speaking freely. You know, they thought he had been, was speaking under duress, you know, that someone was holding the gun to his head or something like that. 
you know, they, they couldn't really believe it. It was a, it was an absolute transformation. Um, and I think in that sense, you know, the, the comparison that became um, quite widespread between um, the May Days and the Kronstadt uprising, which um, for many, sort of, particularly in the anarchist tradition, marks the end point of the um, Russian Revolution, that the last chance for salvaging Soviet democracy in, in 1921, is particularly opposite because you know the, the very people who were like who were putting down this rebellion are the same people who had promised you know promised so much originally as as revolutionary figures, and you know the intention of that is not to like personalize it. You know, these people, individuals, are making decisions in extremely um, tense difficult circumstances that it's impossible to relate to from, you know, a position of like, um, you know, being like, you know, suburban Liverpool. It doesn't, it doesn't compare, you know, you know maybe um, town on a Saturday night, some like um, resemblances, but um, in, in, you know, like there's no way I can really relate to the, the kind of te- the pressure that individuals like that are under. So it's not to, um, you know, like, just condemn people out of hand for making these decisions in, in these circumstances, but to try and empathize with, or to try and like um, reimagine historically reconstruct what it must've been like for um, his former comrades to see such a transformation in his um, whole like um, behavior attitude. And to think, you know, this is where the revolution can end up. Um, you know, the whole point of anarchism is to avoid this kind of like status cul-de-sac. You know, it's, it's to, to, to give yourself freedom and maneuver. Um, so yes, it was, you know, whether they saw it as a, a betrayal or whether they saw it as like a tragedy, you know, yeah, the, um, it was a, 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 a extremely depressing situation for a lot of, a lot of people and continued to be, you know, for decades afterwards, People struggle to understand that you know you can. Some of the correspondence um, has been published between people who were young anarchists at the time, right, and behind the barricades, you know, 16, 17 years old. People like um, Diego Camacho, who later wrote histories under the pen name of Abel Paz. People like Herman Algracia, who later wrote um, under the pen name of Victor Garcia. They both corresponded with um, Garcia Oliver in the, um, I think, in the 60s. Um, and to trying to understand them, you know, they were, they'd lived with it for, for 30 years and they still couldn't get their heads around it, you know. It's, uh, yeah, it's you know, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating, but in, in many ways, yeah, you, you can see why, why it was such a desperate and sad situation for so many people. Uh, so, uh, obviously, the war is not successful uh, for these Spanish anarchists. Uh, it does not go well uh, at the end. Uh, so what was the fate of anarchism in Spain, you know, immediately after the the Civil War ha- had ended? Well, um, I mean, th- those anarchists who remain in Spain face um, terrible uh, persecution, you know, concentration camps, summary execution, um, the, the fate of the broader left in, um, in Spain. You know, there's heartbreaking stories of anarchist assemblies being held um, on the um, the beach at Alicante, where thousands of um, Republicans had gathered, hoping for um, an exit from Spain, right, which never came, right? the boats didn't come. And um, that when when that's apparent, when it's apparent that the, the Italian soldiers are, are bearing down on them, they there are these there are debates, and this is um, detailed in the um, the fantastic. Uh, Granada documentary from the 1980s on the Spanish Civil War. Uh, uh, the debates take place about what to do, right? whether to live to fight another day as prisoners and accept your fate, whatever that may be, or to commit suicide. You know, it's, it's an extraordinary, um, desperate situation that people found themselves in. And um, people like uh, Maximo Franco, who's very young, um, fought at the front, fought at the May Days as well, you know, um, already a young age, a veteran of, of um, Spanish anarchism. He, you know, he, he committed suicide facing the sea. He said, this is my last protest against fascism. It's extraordinary. Um, and, you know, an extremely bitter fate. Thousands also went into exile. Um, 
many Spanish anarchists ended up um, in the French resistance during the Second World War. Um, and then, you know, many others made a go of keeping the organizations going in the underground. You know, that, that was a persistent, constant effort right through um, the 40 years of Francoist dictatorship. And, and anyone who did that was risking everything. You know, people were um, you know, arrested, tortured, killed with um, depressing frequency, in, particularly in the, in the early years, and particularly when it became clear that the um, outcome of the Second World War wasn't going to um, dislodge Franco from power. You know, there's a brief moment of um, thawing, so apparent thawing in terms of the, the state repression. Once it becomes clear that that's not going to last, then you know the crackdown is very, very cruel. And yeah, it's um, you know it's 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 a, it's a sad it's a sad story, but one of course with uh, many examples of extraordinary tenacity, extraordinary resilience, and solidarity. Um, and you know, in, in some ways, anarchism is able to pers- to subsist. Um, it's, it's obviously it's very difficult for people to speak openly about um, anarchism during these years. Um, to you know, to do so is is to is to take extraordinary risks, and that's even right up until um, Franco's death in the mid seventies. I met um, an an anarchist, an extraordinary man called Carlos Diaz, who lives in um, Madrid, who is a, a Catholic anarchist, probably one of the very few Catholic anarchists who um, ever existed, certainly in Spain. And um, he told me that in the, you know, the later years of the Franco dictatorship, he went out on the streets with um, a friend of his, Juan Gomez Casas, who later, you know, later became a leader of the CNC and an uh, um, important historian of Spanish anarchism in his own right. And they went out almost like... Um, Jehovah's Witnesses, it was like evangelicals like knocking on people's doors and saying, hello, would you like to talk about anarchism? <laughs> um, and, you know, uh, Carlos Diaz was, uh, was lifted, was arrested for, for doing just that, you know. Um, so ex- people were taking extraordinary risks in the name of this, um, of fidelity to this idea, to this idealism and to this tradition. And that's uh, extremely humbling. But, the, you know, the end result of 40 years of dictatorship and exile was that when um, after Franco died, there was a massive resurgence of interest in the anarchist movement, and the CNT is involved in important strikes and is attempting to reconstruct itself as an organisation. There is a serious disconnect, or a, a generation gap, because you have these older people who are coming back from exile, these younger people who are coming fresh to the movement. But there isn't really that bridge between those two experiences because the nature of um, the repression have been such that that kind of, um, you know, underground educational culture that was required to like, to nurture um, a generation after the, the civil war just didn't exist. And then, um, you know, that generation gap proved very difficult um, to, yes, to overcome. Excellent. Okay. Uh, thank you for joining me here uh, for this interview. Um, those were fantastic answers. Um, very interesting as well. Um, so thank you. Well, thanks very much for having me. A pleasure. If you would like to read more from Dr. Evans, I've put a link in the show notes to the website where I listed out a lot of the things that I read in preparation 